First of all, I would like to just say a few things about Hong Kong. In Asia Pacific, we see that there will be three financial centers. Okay? One is Shanghai. China wants Shanghai to be the international financial center by 2020. So the most important thing to be an international financial center is that the currency must be convertible. Okay? So we think that it's important for RMB to be convertible, otherwise it's, uh, Shanghai is not much, much of an uh, international financial center. Secondly, it is also very important to talk about Hong Kong. Hong Kong has been an international financial, financial center for a very long time already. And it is important that we understand that you know, there will be competition between Hong Kong and, and Shanghai, and that's healthy competition. As far as Hong Kong is concerned, our competitive edge is facing outside, global. Okay? China still has a long way to go. Their focus will be more on the financial needs within China, because China is huge. Okay? So what we can do is that we should utilize our competitive edge, face the outside, get the international, all the regulations and the advanced technology and so forth, and we may help to lead China going forward. Now, we have to think about one thing, and that is, if Hong Kong, just Hong Kong alone matches against Shanghai, in the long run, Hong Kong will probably lose out. Because purely because of the size, you know, Shanghai has about, uh, I think it's about 18 to 20 million people, lots of industries around Shanghai. So it's a very, very uh, vibrant center. Hong Kong is a service center alone. So what we need to do is actually to make sure that we can work together with Guangdong so that we are the financial center and Guangdong in the industrial center. Okay? So that will make, it, make us big enough to compete with Shanghai. And the third financial center is actually Singapore. Singapore is a little island, but Singapore has been doing very well. So what we need to do is to make sure that we don't lose out to Singapore. We always talk about competition between Hong Kong and Shanghai, but I think what you need to think about is that how can we work with Shanghai to compete with Singapore, All right? So we should not be fighting among ourselves, we actually should be complementing each other, okay? Singapore is growing very quickly, how can we outcompete Singapore, right? That is something that we need to think about. Coming back to Hong Kong, Hong Kong is a very open economy. It has 159 authorized institutions, 159, okay? And it has another 43 uh, money lenders. So lots of competition, and the net result of that is actually a benefit to the customers. Maybe you, maybe the corporates, uh, maybe outside companies, multinationals coming to work in Hong Kong. Now, as far as Hong Kong is concerned, 159 authorized institution, the competition is huge. So you will be facing a lot of competition. So later on, I'll talk about how you should prepare yourself in order you can outcompete the next one sitting to you, all right? Now, when we talk about uh, banking, a lot of times everybody is so um, mesmerized by uh, investment banking, Taohong. Everybody talked about it. Everybody thinks it's the biggest thing on earth. Everybody sort of like, well, I am with uh, J.P. Morgan or HSBC or you know, UBS or whatever. I'm an investment banker. But that's not it. Banking is a lot of things. First of all, let me tell you how many people report to me. All right? First of all, I have four businesses report to me. One is retail. Okay? Uh, it's the branches, the mortgages, the deposits, the, uh, the investment products, and so forth, dealing with consumers. Then the second one is commercial banking. Commercial banking is a lot about local, uh, small to medium-sized corporation. And then the third one is global banking and markets, which is uh, dealing with the big corporates, multinational, and the uh, markets is about treasury. So you have, three, you have three big businesses in there already, so you can go to any one of them. Then the fourth business is private bank. Okay, private banking is getting bigger and bigger all the time, and as a matter of fact, as far as Singapore is concerned, it's being known as a financial, it's sort of like a private banking center 
uh, in Southeast Asia, and it's also known as sort of like the private bank, uh, the Asia Switzerland private bank. Now, you have four lines of businesses. Then I'll talk about those one at a time later on. Then we have uh, compliance, because nowadays with the, regula with the regulations uh, growing in importance around the world, compliance is becoming very important. So you have two types of compliance. Uh, one is regulatory compliance, which is dealing with the, uh, the regulators around the world. And the second one is about uh, financial crime compliance that is dealing with all the money laundering, the, you know, the uh, uh, drug money, and all the illegal type activities, all right? So you have two types of compliance. And then you have technology and operations, okay? Which is becoming more and more important today. Technology is something that's very important to us. As far as I'm concerned, I, one of my background, one of my uh, degree is in, is in computer science. But when I had computer science, the, it's not like a little uh, laptop. It's like the size of this room, so it's different. So uh, as far as technology is concerned, the most important thing is about database. It's about customer information. In other words, because of the global nature of customers, let's say Laura has an account in Hong Kong and one in the United States and one in Canada and one in Sing Singapore and so forth, how can we have a system such that when I input Laura Char's name, that it would pop up all the accounts okay, globally. So it is very important that we have these type of technology because if we don't have these type of technology, it's very hard to follow the customer uh, in terms of its international national activities. And also as far as uh, companies are concerned, the same thing. So companies are global nowadays, operating in various parts of the world. Uh, for example, our company in Hong Kong, like Chiang Kong, is operating like in Australia, in Italy, in uh, uh, UK in, uh, in Canada. So how can we gather all the information and put them together so that we can have a meaningful dialogue? So when I go and see uh, Mr. K.S. Lee, then I would have uh, all the information with me regarding his company so that we can have a meaningful dialogue. So the database management in technology is very, very important. And then we can, get into the, uh, we can get into the internet banking. I think everybody really likes you know, the internet banking nowadays, and we can talk about it later on. So operations and technology is very important. Now, the other part, legal, is also very important. Because nowadays, banks get sued left, right, and center because uh, of the regulations uh, around the world. Now, what's happening nowadays is actually quite interesting. Uh, a lot of, because of politics, people want to get elected and so forth. Sometimes they use, the, uh, they use uh, 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 banking uh, as, like a, uh, as like a punching bag. Uh, so what they do is that they have regulation in 2015 today applying back to, right, to the times of, let's say, 2000 and so forth. So times are very important. So to take... Uh, Take uh, private banking as an example. Private banking in Switzerland in the year 2000 and so forth, these are, I don't know whether you, maybe uh, all of you would have been born by then, but anyway. Uh, it's like, it's number accounts. No name, just number accounts. Uh, and that was the trademark of Switzerland. Today, it's different. You cannot have a number of accounts anymore, you're gonna have a name, and then because of what happened in the past, of the number of accounts, then names become, has been serviced by all these uh, regulations. So when the names are serviced, then people go after those names and say, well, you have evaded tax, uh, you have put your money from here to there and so forth. So there are lots of reg new regulations nowadays that are being applied to practices many, many years ago. So therefore you have problems. And so you have, so that you, the company must have legal department, and also the company must have a credit department to evaluate the risk of the businesses that we're doing. Okay, then that's a very important part. Of, that's a very important part of the of the banking business. Then, what more? What other departments we have? CFO. So you have finance. Okay, we need to understand. We need to report and so forth. And 
uh, the type of reporting that we are doing nowadays, you know, I've, I remember when I first joined the bank, uh, the annual statements is about this thick. Now it's this thick, right? And then if you know everything in, the, in, the, in that big stack, and you'll be a professor already. So then you have CEO, CEO, CFOs. Then you also have, uh, what else? Okay, you also have audit, audit department. Audit department is also very important because it goes around the organization looking at any in the organizations where there are any people or departments that are not following the procedures. Okay. So you have an audit department. And what else do you have? HR. Okay. That's very important because if I want to get my, get my pay, I need to go through HR. And if, I, if you want to be hired, you, want to, you need to go through HR. So there are so many departments. So in other words, what I'm trying to tell you right now is that you're not limited to investment banking. Okay? There are so many departments in the bank that you can join. Now, inside the bank, oh, okay, let me address the gender. Okay, in, in, in Asia Pacific, we have about 60,000 employees uh, and 55% are female and 45% uh, is, uh, is male. So the female wins. <laughs> um, so what I'm trying to tell you is that we have all these, we have all these uh, departments. Now, let me go through the uh, various types of businesses. When people talk about investment banking uh, and also talk about corporate banking, retail banking, and so forth, think about it this way. What happens if you don't have banking? People think, that, oh, banking, you know, now it's a kind of like a, uh, an industry that's not very important and so forth. But let me ask you, what happens if you don't have banking? You get out of the door today, you want to use your credit card. If you don't have banking, you don't have credit cards. Okay? Either you carry like a big stack of cash with you without an account. Well, without an account, you carry all the big stack of cash and how are you, what are you going to do with the money? If you want to get to work, okay, if you don't have an account, the company cannot pay you. If you want to get a house without a mortgage, well, without a bank, you cannot get a mortgage. So everything relates to banking. Now, that's on the personal side, okay? And you have uh, also investment products, insurance, and so forth related to your personal life. Then we talk about commercial banks, uh, commercial banking, that is this a small medium enterprises plus the, uh, the, the mid-sized local corporates. When you do this, it's all about trade. Okay? A lot of it is about trade. Now, if you think about it, the trade in Asia Pacific in, uh, I think, last year is about 5.5 trillion US. Okay, 5.5 trillion US. And so, how do you move these merchandise, move the money around. Without banking, you are not going to be able to do it. Okay? Either through LCs or open accounts and so forth. Without a bank, you won't be able to do it. And the trade nowadays will continue to increase. I'll give you an example. Uh, the, trade in Asia, the trade in Asia Pacific, the intra-regional trade is about $5.5 trillion. And it's going to increase by 10% each, for for each year for the next 10 years. That's the amount of trade that's going to grow. And then the trade between Asia Pacific and, the, and outside of Asia Pacific with Europe and the United States, at this point in time, is about 3.3 to 3.4 trillion. And then it's going to grow at a rate of about 5% a year. So trade will continue to grow, especially with the growth of China. Okay? Definitely, it's going to impact you know, your life you know, your life in Hong Kong. And whatever industry you're going to be in, if you deal with trade, it's going to, you're, going to have to deal with the, you're going to have to deal with banks. On multinational, big banks, big corporations, and so forth, they have operations all over the world. You, can, you have to help them to do IPOs. Uh, you're going to help them to issue bonds. Uh, you're going to help them to do uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and you're going to have to help them to uh, do the hedging in terms of currencies and so forth. So lots of things going on in each of the, in each of the businesses, various types of things, depending on your personality. 
Some people would be very, very good in mathematics and they want to work on you know, the currencies and so forth. You go into markets. Okay? In Chinese, it's called chao okay? And if you are somebody who is really like, has very good interpersonal skills and you, know, you want to work with customers, then you go into a large corporation or you go to the large local corporates. And if you're somebody that you want to, if you're somebody who wants to work with uh, customers and you don't want all the complicated stuff, then you can work in retail banking. And if you say that, I really don't want to work with anybody, I don't want to work with customers, I don't want to touch anything on products and stuff, then you work in the operations department. Okay? You can work in computers, computers department, you can work in finance. It's depending on your own personality and depending on your own interests. So it is very important that you understand your own personality. What do you really want? I don't want to overemphasize the importance of banking going forward. Okay? It is, uh, without banking, the world is not going to function, especially with, global, with, with uh, the global trend in terms of trade uh, and also the global trend in terms of investment. Okay. Lots of people in Hong Kong are now buying properties in uh, Australia, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Canada, in uh, UK and US and so forth. So how do you move these money around? Also, it's also very important that you understand that when you are working in a bank, it's not like you go into the department and you get stuck there. You can move around. You can, after you've, after you've done a certain job for a while, you say, well, I really, this is not really for me. I want to move in another, into another department. Yes, you can do that, but provided you have done well. You can't say that, well, I'm not doing well in this. I want to go into another job. You can't do that. Okay? You have to be able to do well. You have to be able to demonstrate your ability. So you think about it, again, the four lines of businesses that I've just told you. Right? The uh, retail bank, the commercial bank, the global banking and markets, and private bank. Now, in each of these business lines, again, you replicate the whole thing. Like, for example, in retail banking, you have retail banking credit, retail banking legal, retail banking operations, retail banking technology, retail banking compliance, retail banking audit. Okay? Whole set. Then you go into commercial banking, same thing. You have commercial banking credit, commercial banking uh, 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 operations, commercial banking finance, commercial banking, you know, it's such the audit uh, compliance, the whole thing again. And then the same thing you repeat it with for global banking and markets. So in other words, in each of the business lines, you have the whole thing, the whole functional thing again in terms of the support function, we call it, the HR and so forth. So you need to have HR in retail, HR in commercial banking, HR in global banking and markets, and HR in private banking. Because every single business has its own characteristics. And those characteristics would have to match your interests and your skills. So it is very important that you understand, need to understand what your own personality is. You know, try to join some of these. Now, when I was with another bank and I was doing some recruiting, uh, I recruited in one trip to U.S. I recruited uh, ten people, uh, and out of the ten, four of them have no their studies, their few, their, their majors have no relationship to economics or finance or whatever. The biology major, history major, chemistry major, and physics major. The reason I'm telling you this is because, you know, you don't have to be a finance major to act, to be good in 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 a bank in the banking industry. You can learn. But what we are looking for are, are people who are smart, who are willing to learn, who are inquisitive. We don't want people who say, "Well, I'm just going to sit there and kind of like." be with myself and that's it. That's not going to work in a, global, in a global industry like banking. And also I think it's very important for you to understand not to chit chat on your mobile phone and computers all day long because you lose your communication skills. 
let's assume a situation that I'm standing right in front of you right now, and I'm just sit, standing like this and you know, reading out a piece of paper to you, that's my speech, and that's it. You have no interest whatsoever. Okay. If I cannot talk to you the way I'm talking to you right now, you have no interest. You would say that I'm just a piece of wood. Okay. So I think it's very important for you to understand you must improve your communication skills because by the end of the day, if you want to be a leader, okay, for you to be a leader, you must be able to stand in front of a crowd and let people know what you're thinking about, where do you want to take the company, what your vision is, and then what your strategy and what your execution plan is. And then you're going to have to be able to explain it in a very clear fashion within, let's say, 30 minutes. But if you cannot do that, okay, and then it's very difficult. It's very difficult to convince people that they will follow you. So I'm, also, so I'm very, I'm, I'm, sometimes I get very concerned about students, you know, all, when they look at their mobile phones and, you know, laptops all the time, they're not talking to each other and so forth. That, that, that gets me, I have a lot of concerns about that. Okay. So I think it's very important for you to talk to people. Now, let me talk to you about how would you, what would we be looking for when we recruit someone? Of course, your academic studies is part of it, okay? Let's say your academic, it's pretty good. Your numbers, you know, your, your achievements have been very good and you get an interview. Um, these things tend to be overlooked. The first thing about interview is that, is that the handshake, your, uh, the way you dress, okay, it's very important. Okay, if you, you need to be presentable, right? So you need, how to dress, you need to know how to dress. And then when you face your interviewer and you meet him or her for the first time, the handshake is very important. I see it so often that people come to, the, come to my office and they shake hands like this and then they just sit down. They don't even know who I am. They're not watching my face. They're not watching my eyes. I, we, have no con we have no eye contact whatsoever. And the handshake is as soft as, I don't know what to, what to say. It's like, hi. You know. So it's very important for you to make sure you have that, you know, to, have that, to, to create that first impression. You go in there, you look the person in the eye, okay, and you say, do a handshake. When you're doing your handshake, okay, again, you need to look the person in the eye. Now, it's very, very impolite. Okay, and I've seen it more often than not. Lots of people, when they do the handshake, it's like they do the handshake and they turn their head already. This is really, really bad. A lot of arrogant people do that all the time. Okay? They think that, you know, I know everybody, so I just, my handshake is like, hi, how are you? And then, you know, off they go. That's really, really bad. So you need to create that good impression. Second thing is that when you go and interview, you need to have some idea about the company. You need to do your preparation. What's the, the company's history? At least you read something about the company in terms of its performance in the last few years, and what are the latest news about that company, so we can create a conversation. Without that, there's nothing to talk about. If I ask you, I say, well, what do you know about HSBC? And you sit there and say, well, it's a very big company. Okay. That will be a big problem. Okay, that, you know, the interview process will be very short and then that's it. You need to know about the company. You need to talk, you know, sort of like have some idea about the company and you need to have an idea. You need, don't be afraid to express your opinion about the company. And the reason is that we don't expect you to get it right the first time. If you can get everything right the first time, you might as well replace me. Right? So we don't expect you to get it right the first time, but what we do expect you is to have an inquisitive mind. Ask questions. Why is your company doing this? Why is your company doing that? You know, can you do it in a better way? That's very important so that you demonstrate that you have an inquisitive mind. Right? The other thing that's also very important is that you have to demonstrate to you that you have the lateral thinking. It's not like about, okay, is this number big or small or bigger than the target or smaller than the target? For example, let's say the oil price dropped now. 
by what? From 120 bucks to the current 50, 60 dollars. What does that mean to the company? What does that mean? Okay, what does that mean to countries that are producing commodities, producing oil, like Canada? You saw, you, you would have seen Canada's currency drop by 20%. And what, what, what does it do to Australia? Same thing, currency dropped by almost 20%. And what does it do to countries like China? Because China is very oil dependent, they, they buy a lot of oil, and now the price have gone down. So what does it do to China? What does this do to the airline industry? So you need to have this lateral thinking in terms of once you see something, okay, what you need to be very quick in terms of what is the impact. Now, the only way you can get that, okay, the only way you can get that is to make sure you read the international newspapers every day. Like the you know, Financial Times or Wall Street Journal or whatever. And then when, if you're taking finance courses, take some of the questions, go and ask your professors. I'm not sure they know everything, <laughs> right? But ask them, challenge them, right? What does that mean? You know, right? What does it mean by uh, Greek coming out of the Eurozone? What does it mean by if UK uh, uh, voted to get out of the Eurozone? What does, that all, what, does that, what does all of that mean? What does it mean by, by uh, Europe, the, ne the negative interest rates, getting very low interest rates? What does it, what does it, how does it impact the United States? How does it impact Hong Kong? So you need to be very quick in terms of your lateral thinking. And the only way you can get that is by reading newspapers and question what's on the newspapers. That one, uh, at one point in time, I was, uh, somebody asked me, what am I going to do after my retirement? I said, I'm going to teach. And he said, well, well, what are you going to teach? I said, you know, I don't know, probably finance. You know, I've been in it all, the, all, all my life. And the thing is, I said, what kind of you know, books are you going to use? I said, I'm not going to use any books. I just take a piece of newspaper and teach. Seriously, think about it. If I take the Financial Times every day to go into the classroom and I said, this is what's happened in the world. Tell me what's the impact on Hong Kong. Then you, your mind has to work. You know, what is it, Hong Kong about? Hong Kong is a financial industry. Okay? And what does it mean by uh, the export, the, 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 the market in the US is not doing well and Europe is not doing well? Then it affects the export of Hong Kong. So if your mind can work like that and you train your mind to work like that, I guarantee you the way you speak will be very different. The grammar that you use and your dialogue with the interviewer will be very different because you know a lot more about what's going on around the world. So if you can do that, I'll guarantee you, you get a job. Right? And the one thing is also very important, and that is about mobility. Now, throughout my career, I've seen, you know, uh, I've been working in the big companies, uh, big banking companies, and I've seen people moving around all the time. It's always the, the Western people, the Indians, the, uh, you know, uh, Hong Kong people, they don't like to move away from Hong Kong for some reason, because it's too comfortable. Your mother is taking care of your food and everything, and then very soon you get a boyfriend or you get a girlfriend, you don't want to go anywhere. But that's not what's happening today. Everybody moves everywhere. Okay. So, if, so you have to mentally prepare yourself that if you enter a company, if you enter an international bank, okay, you're gonna, they're, gonna want, they're gonna ask you, say, okay, are you willing to, are you mobile? And if you say, yo, I'm not mobile, then you're your chances are getting smaller. But if you're mobile, that's a different story. I can send you to China, I can send you to Singapore, I can send you to you know, uh, Malaysia. One of the issues that we have in Hong Kong regarding our students, our students are very smart. I mentor quite a few of them. But what we lack in Hong Kong, as far as students are concerned, is exposure. What's happening in the world? You know, what do you know about the culture in Malaysia? What do you know about the culture in China? What do you know about the culture in Singapore? If you don't know anything, how can you 
kind of like manage. If I say, well, you know, you need to manage Singapore today, okay, what would be the first question that you ask? What's this, what's Singapore, where is it? You know, what's the size of Singapore? What's the population? What's the GDP? What's the, what's the main industries that constitute the GDP? You know, how does it grow? You know, these are the things that need to come into your mind. You, have, you need to have an inquisitive mind. That, the reason I'm spending so much time on this is because that is the, one of the key aspects that we're looking for when we're hiring people. It's not about just your studies. It's about how you think. Okay? That will determine your potential. It will determine how far you can go. The other thing that I think that is very important for you is that you need to have a very open mind. Okay? Open mind about other people, the people that you work with. Okay? You need to be a team player. Okay? You need to be able to work with any race of people if you're in the national company. You also need to be able to have an open mind about accepting comments, criticisms. People saying that, well, you can do this better. Don't take it negatively. Take it positively. You're trying to improve yourself. And also, it's also very important that you have an open mind about change because change is a constant. And one thing that you need to understand, and that is, it's always better to lead a change than to follow a change. To lead a change, you can decide what needs to be changed. To follow a change, somebody has decided for you. Okay? So if you're going to do a new project and so forth, you want to be in the driver's seat. You want to be able to determine what are the changes that you want to make. If you just want to be a follower, that means that you don't have to think as much because you're following others. Leading changes will make you a leader. Okay? Because you need to understand what the impact of all the changes, the implications on people. If you don't, you're not going to be very successful. Okay. So these are the things that I think it's very important for you to prepare yourself when you are going through an interview. Now, I've talked about the various um, aspects of, uh, of banking, a lot of the different fields that you can get into. I've talked about that you don't have to have a banking background or finance background in order to get into banking. I've talked about what are the interview, what are the skills that you need to have in order to get into banking. So with that, I'll stop. I think that I've already used up 45 minutes. So I'll open, I'll open up to questions.